Good morning, everyone. I'm going to I'm going to get us get us started here. <laughs> it's great to see this turnout for the 50th year reunion and reminiscing. So, uh, for those of you who I haven't met, I'm Larry Jamison. I'm the dean of the school. Uh, we've got a great weekend lined up, really great. And just looking at today, uh, we'll begin with this panel, which we've done now for seven years. Stan Dudrick uh, helped found this idea seven years ago. And following this, our chief scientific officer, uh, John Epstein, is going to have a panel discussion about you know what's coming next in science. And then I think all of you, if you have an interest, would like to hear our Cancer Center Director, Bob Vonderheide, uh, lead a panel discussion of what's happening in cancer research and cancer care. And if, if you haven't followed this, uh, you know, in many ways, this is the epicenter of a lot of new treatments in cancer, and I'm sure that will be uh, fascinating. Uh, then later on, we've got some of the alumni awards ar around lunch. Uh, we're going to have an interview with Stan Prusner, Nobel laureate, uh, discoverer of the prion model for transmitting a variety of neurological disorders. And then this, this evening, we're going to celebrate, among other things, uh, Gail Morrison's leadership as the Senior Vice Dean for Education over at the Logan Hotel. And that's just today. Last night, we had a wonderful scholarship uh, reception, a huge turnout of scholarship donors as well as the students at that event. It was a wonderful, beautiful evening. Half the crowd was out on the porch overlooking the construction site for the new patient pavilion, the new hospital. So just thinking about this class of 68, uh, I think the Ravden building was about maybe six or eight year, uh, years old and our newest building. Uh, it's time for a new hospital. You know, we, if you walk in, into HUP now, uh, great people. You know, terrific learning environment, outstanding clinical care, really outstanding. We've got among the best clinical outcomes in, in the country, but uh, it's hard to make rounds with 10, 12, 15, 20 people uh, inside an old facility. So we're looking forward to the new patient pavilion. It's going to be 500 rooms. Those rooms can be transition from inpatient to intensive care unit without moving the patient. So we'll move the teams instead of the people. There'll be 60 interventional suites. It's the largest construction project in the history of the city of Philadelphia. So if you, look, if you have a chance to look out at it, uh, we're at about the eighth floor now of steel. Uh, it's going to be 14 altogether, just to give you a, a sense of the scale. It's like a skyscraper lying on its side. Uh, it will be connected uh, to HUP. And you'll have a lot of events here in the Jordan Medical Education Center. Uh, take time to explore back in, into some of the, uh, the learning components of it, the classrooms. So it's a lot more than the lobby, and I think you'll enjoy uh, seeing where the first and second year students spend uh, the bulk of their time. And the campus has just changed tremendously. You know, since the convention center moved from here to downtown Philadelphia, it's giving us, along with CHOP, a great opportunity to, to rebuild our research and educational and clinical facilities. So we're going to have a terrific panel. Uh, many of you know this crowd. Uh, they're going to talk about their careers after 50 years of, of practicing medicine and carrying out uh, the different experiences, whether in, in research or teaching or administration. Uh, we want to have time for some interchange with you, so think about comments or questions you might uh, want to address. And I'll, I'll now turn it over to uh, Lawrence Kirsten, who's going to introduce the panel and get things started. There seems to be a special place for Larry's around here. La Larry Lipschitz and, okay. Well, first, thanks, thank you, everybody, for being here. It's really an exciting kind of a landmark in, in our lives to have been 50 years out of medical school. Um, what we got to see in our lives is we, we were among the luckiest people in the world. We had um, 
an education that was unsurpassed. We've had remarkably good lives, and in the scheme of the world, uh, we're among the luckiest people on the planet. Um, none of us have probably had a boring day since we started medical school, and that's certainly the case for me. Uh, Penn was a special place for me because, like college, I had phenomenal mentors. I, I can count, I mean, it takes all my, think, all my digits to count, to count them, phenomenal people who really um, directed me, and classmates that were of such good quality and such good humor that it was a wonderful experience and uh, everybody helped everybody. Um, I have great gratitude to uh, my family for living with me over the years when I practiced medicine. Uh, and um, I did marry the woman I met in medical school, except it was nine years later, Toba. And uh, that was, uh, so the medical school did many good things, but it took me a while to sort of get all the pieces together. Um, we've collected a, a very sort of representative group of people uh, people from our class to talk. Um, uh, about half of us are retired, half are not really retired. Um, uh, different areas of expertise, uh, hardcore research versus full-time academic stuff to a few of us that were clinicians. And uh, so it, I think it represented the spread of things in, uh, in a typical Penn Medical School class. Uh, I was struck by the fact today when I came in that there were about 10 or more of us from Central High School in the class, and there were really a, a bunch of us. But that was, that was also a remarkable event. I don't know anybody who went to medical school who, who found that many classmates from high school when he started in the anatomy lab. Um, the, uh, we'll have time for some questions as things wind down. Um, I, I think my last comment is that we had we had this incredible confluence of things in our lives. Medicare started in 1967, so there was this massive bolus of money that got poured into the system, and it took a quarter of a century for them to start whittling away at the auto autonomy. So there was this very nice period of 25 years of money and autonomy, and then as, the, as they whittled away at the autonomy, things did change, for, and we all adapted, obviously adapted. Um, the last thing is I'd like to thank uh, Nicole McGarry for pulling all the pieces together. I think she's probably working and not listening. And I see Kobe Smith's silent hand in all of this as well. So it's much appreciated. And um, our, our first um, panelist, each of these very nice people are going to sp speak for about 10 minutes. And uh, we're going to see uh, what, you know, what their insights are. And uh, we'll have questions at the end. Uh, Sandy Brenner is a uh, cardiologist, retired. He and I spent a year, we were interns together at Duke when interning was a, still a, a, now it's PGY1, I guess. Uh, so we both, both of us probably belonged in mental hospitals because who would sign up for five out of seven nights? Uh, in today's world, that would be considered child abuse, right? <laughs> anyway, Sandy. Again, good morning. Um, I'd like to give you a, a fly-by look at my journey and adventure through the beginnings and ramp up of coronary intervention, a, a journey I couldn't have imagined in my wildest dreams while I was a student at Penn. Uh, reflecting back on my time at Penn, uh, during the clinical years, I particularly enjoyed the challenges of physical diagnosis. Uh, my role models included Francis Wood, the iconic chair of medicine who taught us physical diagnosis, Claude Joyner, cardiology, Frank Elliott, neurology. Uh, another role model was Christian Lamberson, with whom I spent many hours doing research in his hyperbaric chamber. Well, I loved, I loved my time at Penn, but I still thought a change of scene would be healthy, and wound up following Jim Weingarten, the chair of medicine, when he left to assume the chair at Duke. Um, so uh, internship, as Larry said, five out of seven I'd call. Uh, residency Cardiology Fellowship. Um, we had a choice between two fellowship tracks, clinical and cath lab. Well, uh, I love taking care of patients. I still love the challenges of physical diagnosis. I love some of our clinical toys back then, phonocardiography, vector cardiography, early days of echocardiography. Uh, I thought what the cath guys did was really neat, but in the end, they just seemed to tee patients up for the surgeons. 
Uh, after Duke, I owed the Air Force two years of active duty as part of a Berry Plan deferment and wound up at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, where uh, I was very fortunate to overlap uh, with a Mayo-trained CAF guy, Mike Hines, and, and got essentially a mini fellowship in the CAF lab, um, something that I enjoyed a lot, but I had no import at the time as to, no, no concept of the time as to how important it would turn out to be. Um, after the Air Force, 1975, I followed a well-worn path of other Duke physicians to the Watson Clinic in Lakeland, Florida. Uh, already there, uh, Ivan Brown in cardiovascular surgery, a former James B. Duke professor, another Duke surgeon, Gordon Moore, uh, senior cardiologist, Bill Gleason, had actually been the first cath fellow when Henry McIntosh ran the Duke cath lab. Uh, and the other cardiologist, Bob Bacino, had trained at MGH. Uh, well, Henry, who, by the way, was a 1950 graduate of this medical school, uh, was actually chief of cardiology while I was uh, spent most of my time at Duke. Uh, but he was subsequently recruited by Baylor to become chair of medicine. But um, as Larry can probably down here attest to, he got tired of butting heads with, um, with Michael DeBakey and wound up joining us as our junior partner. Uh, I've got lots of great Henry stories. Can you hear me? Okay, okay thank you. Sorry. Um, uh, fast forward, uh, 1979, Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, Cleveland Clinic symposium honoring Mason Soans on the 20th anniversary of the first coronary arteriogram. Uh, keynote speaker, Andres Grunzig, Zurich, Switzerland. Uh, who two years before had done the first coronary balloon angioplasty. Well, Grunzik was an absolute rock star. I've never seen anything at a meeting before or since. Uh, he was actually uh, recruited to go to Emory, where I was fortunate enough to get to know him, learn from him, until he was tragically killed uh, at a young age while piloting his private plane. So I, uh, I returned, to, returned to Lakeland, uh, w w wait a while, and then corner Bill Gleason uh, and say, Bill, um, I think we finally have enough data to validate this procedure, and I think it's time for us to get into it. Uh, it seems to me, though, that to start with, it would probably be best if one guy did all of it just to maximize exposure experience. Um, I'd love to do it, I said, but you're the senior guy. If you want to do it, I'll support you. So uh, Bill says, well, I hear they just started doing them in Gainesville. Let me go watch a couple of cases. So Bill goes to Gainesville, watches a couple of cases, uh, comes back and says, Brenner, you do it. <laughs> um, uh, so those early cases were long, difficult, stressful, uh, but wow, were they exciting. Uh, fast forward, 1984, I recruit a young guy out of Indiana, Kevin Brown, who uh, brings with him a passion for clinical research. Well, before I knew it, uh, we had device company engineers hanging out in the cath lab. Uh, we were doing the trial work for the SIMED balloon catheter. They were later bought out by Boston Scientific. Uh, we were one of the early groups to routinely take acute MIs to the cath lab for primary angioplasty. We were part of the PAMI trial, randomizing angioplasty versus TPA, a clot buster. Um, we started a company designed to take used but single, but supposedly single-use angioplasty and uh, electrophysiology catheters, restore them to original manufacturer specs, and reuse them. And, and the series of new devices. Uh, David Auth came to our lab from the West Coast to get us started in rotational atherectomy. Uh, I went to San Francisco to learn directional atherectomy from John Simpson. Uh, Rouen, France, to learn uh, aortic balloon valvuloplasty from Cribier and Latec. Um, and uh, other new devices, uh, uh, eczema laser, angiogen thrombectomy, intracoronary ultrasound, and others. Well, I just, I just love this stuff. I loved, I loved, I loved everything about it. I, I loved, you know, the, my patients and the team I work with. I love my cath lab toys. Um, I loved doing clinical research and being on the cutting edge. I loved being in the arena and taking care of acutes. I love the challenges of, of uh, complex intervention. Um, I, I literally look forward to going to work almost every day of my career until the day I retired. I was, I was very fortunate. Um, well, to carry on, early 1990s, we get ourselves into a trial of the GR2, geotrical rubin coronary stent. Uh, well, the trial was set up so that um, the stent was approved for so-called bailout devices only. Uh, it was not at all uncommon in those days to 
uh, get a beautiful, pristine result after a balloon angioplasty. But then hours later, to get sudden total reocclusion. Well, I, I, would, I would treat this by uh, doing prolonged balloon inflation. It's frequently from a so-called autoperfusion balloon. Uh, routinely several minutes to try and prevent. Uh, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes or longer if necessary to treat. Uh, I actually did a uh, reported a case on a five-hour inflation to um, resolve recurrent reocclusion in a patient after an inferior MI. Well, the stent worked as a bailout device. It was, it was wonderful, uh, although it had some major downsides. It was high profile, difficult to use, uh, high rate of early restenosis, and associated with an absolutely brutal uh, anticoagulation regimen. Um, fast forward, 1996, seminal moment in cardiology. Uh, the FDA approves the Johnson & Johnson Paul Mez Schatz coronary stent, and the world of cardiology would never, ever be the same. Um, it, it's, it's difficult for young docs in the cath lab today to appreciate how limited and how primitive uh, the early equipment was. We frequently needed ingenuity, gerrymandering to get things done. Uh, for example, in order to do an angioplasty or put in a stent, you first had to take a so-called guiding catheter in from a femoral artery or later radial, uh, position it within the coronary ostium, and then pass your equipment balloon stents through it. Well, if it didn't fit really well, you frequently wouldn't have enough support to get your high-profile uh, Roly devices out there. So if necessary, I always had a tea kettle in the cath lab. I would turn it on and then use the steam heat to reshape the tip of the catheter so that it fit. Uh, Saffinocene grafts were a particular challenge. They were long and they were big. Um, so sometimes if you had a lesion in the distal portion of a long graft or in a coronary distal to a long graft, you just plain couldn't reach it from a femoral guiding catheter. So I'd literally take the guiding catheter, cut it in half, uh, reattach the hub, and perform the procedure via an axillary approach. Um, the largest coronary stents made back then were three and a half millimeters, and vein grafts were frequently much, much bigger than that. So if necessary, I would take a biliary stent, off-label, of course, uh, crimp it onto a large peripheral angioplasty balloon and get it done. Um, so, wow, what, what an exciting and amazing journey it, in fact, was. Um, our, our, our class, the uh, class of 1968, uh, practiced medicine during an era which arguably had more important technology ramp up more quickly than at any other time in history. I have no doubt that many members of our class, many of you could get up here and recount journeys very similar to mine. We were, we were all very, very fortunate to be part of it. Thank you. Two, two things were clear, your love of your work and how exciting it all has been. I think that as you walk around Penn, you'll, as someone who's been in Philadelphia for all these years, it, it's not as dramatic to me because I see the changes almost on a regular basis, but the dramatic changes around here, uh, the, the quote that I think fits best and it has to do with both our careers and this institution, is the sleeping giant has awakened. And in, in terms of medicine generally, it was this explosion of technology, and I think the Medicare money facilitated a lot of it and accelerated a lot of it. But um, we've each seen this in our careers, what, what technology has done, and I think there are more than a few of us in the room, like myself, who have benefited personally from the technology. Um, uh, our, our next... Uh, Speaker is Betty Lell. Betty's a pediatric neurologist, a good friend. We overlapped in New York for a few years. Um, uh, Betty was one of about eight or nine women in a class of 125. Fortunately for medicine, fortunately for society, fortunately for the medical school, that's changed. She was also one of about uh, rough, roughly 10% of our class, including myself, David Cook, um, and a number of others that went into neurology. We, that was, we were overrepresented. I think psychiatry also was overrepresented, and it was because of the incredible mentors. I personally have seen eight different, sh I've stayed in Philly and Lake David, have been connected with Penn forever, and uh, in some ways David much more intimately than I, but I've, I've uh, lived with, dealt with, and had dealings with you know, eight different chairs of neurology, and uh, what Betty's career will, Betty has a, has a very different story to tell, but the technology story we've heard now we're, now we're going to hear a somewhat different story. Thank you. 
Can you hear me, first of all? Yes. Okay, if you can't, just raise your hand in the back. Uh, born into a medical family, my twin brother and I uh, have continued on a path that seemed almost inevitable from C-section delivery to becoming physicians ourselves. My father, Dr. William Lell, received a graduate degree in otolaryngology in 1937 and worked with Chevalier Jackson in developing a flexible forceps for removing diaper pins. Nobody uses diaper pins anymore. <laughs> and other foreign bodies. He also published on the association of tobacco smoking and laryngeal carcinoma and treatments for laryngeal tuberculosis. As children, our stuffed animals never had button eyes and peanuts were forbidden. <laughs> Perhaps that is why I did not choose his specialty, even though we used to marvel at the collection of objects he had extracted through a, a bronchoscope. <laughs> I knew at an early age I would add an MD to my name, but when pursuing pre-med courses at Wellesley, I majored in art history and biblical history. I encourage this kind of fine arts humanities balance, not only in pre-med studies, but into and beyond medical school. Developing the skills of observation and an understanding of humanity and ethics is essential to the practice of medicine. While I was sure my calling was to be a physician, entering medical school in 1964 for a woman was no easy task. The message was clear. Women would drop out because they couldn't handle the pressure or would defect for marriage and motherhood. Women made up less than 10% of our class. Looking back, I can see how Penn's esteemed faculty inspired me. Louis Barnes made sure you paid attention in pediatrics by shooting a water pistol at you. <laughs> he introduced the term FLK, funny looking kid, and was known to ask if having a simian crease, a single line on your palm, was a sign of pathology before showing you that he had one. <laughs> a single one has no pathology. I worked with Frank Oski and Irving Woolman in hematology. They were studying the effect of transfusion therapy on children with thalassemia in the US compared to untreated children in Ferrara, Italy. It was my first exposure to clinical research when I went with our classmate Martha Davison to Ferrara to obtain blood specimens and dental molds of children. The greatest influence, however, came from G. Milton Chai, neurology department chair from 1962 to 1967. He and Nicholas Gennatis, who came to Penn in 1964, used the electron microscope to show that abnormalities in structures such as the cell membrane or mitochondria were the basis for inherited disorders. No longer were we simply labeling diseases by the names of people who had described certain symptoms and pathology. This was the start of looking at the disease process at a cellular, biochemical, and genetic level. Penn has indeed led the way in defining new diseases and treatments for them. When I chose to specialize in neurology, L-DOPA was just being used for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. A breakthrough chronicled by Oliver Sacks in Awakenings. Since this was before MRI and PET scans, the neurologic exam and history were essential for localization of disease. Imaging could only be done via pneumoencephalogram or carotid angiography. It was an intellectual challenge to go through the tests for occipital or parietal, parietal lobe dysfunction or map out the sensory deficit from a spinal cord or peripheral nerve lesion. On leaving Penn, I did my neurology training at the University of Vermont under Charles Poser, who suggested I should continue consider, considering the newly developing field of child neurology. 
1957, Sidney Carter and Philip Dodge obtained federal funding for the training fellowships for child neurology. In 1967, special cer certification in child neurology was offered for the first time by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. I received a fellowship and trained with both Sidney Carter and Philip Dodge. They were great teachers and excellent clinicians. Naturally, the neurologic examination of an infant or child is different, requiring patience and ingenuity. Dr. Dodge would routinely sing Mary Had a Little Lamb to children while doing an exam. Dr. Carter always spent time to be sure the family and child were involved in understanding the findings and prognosis. Compassion and the importance of taking time with patients when they are most vulnerable is a legacy given to their trainees. Advances in the field have created new subspecialties. Dr. Joseph Volpe and others have studied the developing brain and disorders affecting the developing fetus and neonate. This has led to early intervention programs being established to evaluate children at risk of delay and help maximize function and support families. Other advances have been the ability to maintain adults and children on life support and the advent of organ transplantation. This led to the development of the Harvard Criteria for Brain Death Determination in 1968 with subsequent reviews and discussion. Frequently, it is the neurologist called to document the findings and inform colleagues and family. Additionally, the field of medical ethics has grown with an emphasis on informed consent, patient advocacy, and institutional review committees for clinical research. As new treatments and protocols for therapy and in interventions become available, the need to consider and convey risk and benefit to the patient is all the more essential. I value the opportunity to serve <clears throat> on the ethics committee at St. Vincent's Hospital while chief of pediatric neurology and teach medical ethics at New York Medical College. I have always seen the practice of medicine as a vocation and access to basic medical care as a right, not a privilege. St. Vincent's Hospital in Manhattan was founded by the Sisters of Charity. No patient was turned away for inability to pay. We treated babies in the neonatal unit in withdrawal from cocaine. We provided care to babies with HIV before preventative treatment with AZT to lower the risk of transmission was known, and there was fear and social stigma surrounding the disease. With the first world, <laughs> I'm getting signals, just I'm gonna stop. <laughs> with the first World Trade garage bombing, we took care of a pregnant mother carried down the stairs by firefighters. Both she and her premature baby survived. On 9-11, I watched from the pediatric floors as the towers came down, and we waited for the survivors that never came. As a child neurologist, I have been called upon to testify in cases of child abuse, and being able to confirm that neurological exam and imaging were not consistent with accidental trauma in the case of Lisa Steinberg led to the conviction of Joel Steinberg. On a more personal note, it has been said that too much knowledge can be a bad thing. As a child neurologist and an elderly prima gravita, I was aware of all the possible worst outcomes when I was pregnant at 40. Fortunately, my worries were unfounded and we have two wonderful daughters. Being a mother and a physician called for juggling time, having an understanding husband and good childcare. I was fortunate. I still have on my cell phone the message Elise sent me when she found out that she had matched at Penn. It was especially memorable for me uh, when Elise was given her white coat and we recited the Hippocratic Oath together, a tradition started by Dr. Arnold Gold, a child neurologist and mentor of mine. Elise graduated in the class of 2013, which was 40% women. She had many choices, uh, was interested in global health, uh, a area that Penn supports, 
and while at Penn took an extra year to work on a project with Dr. Ian Bennett screening children with developmental delay among Mexican immigrants. This was a multidisciplinary study and she worked with specialists in departments of social work, education, and, Penn, and medicine. Uh, Penn is unique in devising these kind of interdepartmental programs that reflect an individual's interest and it's a great asset here at Penn. As alumni 50 years later, we are coming back to a campus that has changed dramatically. We are renewing friendships and remembering shared experiences. Penn Med continues to excel in its commitment to provide excellence in teaching and advances in medical science to benefit clinicians and society in general. Going forward, we as physicians must continue to be aware and to respond to policies that challenge the delivery of healthcare. Patients have stories to tell us and we must have time to listen. Continuity of care and access to care remain challenges for many. We must remain advocates for our patients who rely on our unique knowledge and compassion. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Uh, all of that is most, most important, and we often forget it. Um, I think with medical student debt loads, when, when upon graduation today, that it be, even becomes a harder job. Um, Larry Lipschultz is our next speaker. Larry is from a, a different end of the, the body and the world. He's from Texas and is a uh, renowned uh, expert in men's reproductive health, so all of us pay close attention. Uh, and. Uh, Come, come and is a uh, uh, um, full time at Baylor, I believe. And um, so, let's hear what you've got to say. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> so I was charged with talking about uh, my uh, career as a urologist in the field of male reproductive health, as well as those mentors at Penn that have helped me along the way. So to do so, we have to go back to 1982, when as a second year undergraduate, uh, seeking a medicine-related summer job at Penn, I was assigned to work under Joe Courier, Jr. Uh, we worked at the Harrison Department of Surgical Research uh, in the Ritzich Building on the beautiful Hamilton Walk. Joe was a urology resident and became my lifelong mentor. I entered Penn, as we all did, in 1964, but I already had, I believe, one foot in the door of urology. I was not a good student in those preclinical years. The really smart guys sat in the front row, like Stanley Prusner. I sat with the other members of Phi Chi, my medical fraternity, in the rear. It wasn't until I started my clinical years that I developed some self-assurance and my ability to be a productive physician. During these years, I continued to work with Joe Courier, who was now junior faculty in urology, and with Dave Kuhl, who was working on a prototype of the radionuclide scanner. David then went on to become a pioneer in the development of PET scanning. During those years, I even presented with both of these uh, mentors at a podium session at the Federation Proceedings in Atlantic City and was literally creamed by the then head of urology at Barnes St. Louis. It was my welcome to academics. I applied for a Penn surgery internship, was accepted, and somehow managed not to get the cardiovascular surgery rotation that was so dreaded. I did, however, rotate on ob -GYN, and this is really where my story begins. While attending a grand round session led by Dr. Luigi Mastriani, who was then the head of OBGYN and a giant in the field of female fertility, I listened to a PhD from New York, Dr. John McLeod, discuss the intricacies of human sperm and the clinical applications of understanding its function. At the conclusion, Dr. Mastriani remarked that while we were on the threshold of a new exciting era in female fertility and possibly even looking forward in the next few years to in vitro fertilization, he had no urologist to whom to send the husbands of his infertile couples. 
A literal light bulb went off in my head, and I thought, why not? I was going into urology anyway, and this was a wide open field. I entered urology residency when Alan Wien was junior faculty and Joan Courier was senior faculty. Alan, by the way, just stepped down last year and is still emeritus professor in urology here. The two of them saw to it that my goal was realized. I started a male fertility clinic during my research year uh, at my residency. I saw patients once a week and had my nurse perform semen analyses, which never would be allowed in this CLIA uh, environment we now work. My clinical career in reproductive medicine had really started. Uncle Sam then got me for the next two years, from 71 to 73, and I worked at William Beaumont Army Hospital in El Paso, filling, filling the shoes of a uh, full-time Army officer who had decided that he didn't want to be a surgery resident. Um, my mentors at that time were two higher-ranked uh, physicians than I, and truly mentors uh, in, the, in the very sense of the word. Uh, and for the second time, I started a male fertility clinic, this time in the Army. I returned to Penn, finishing the Army in 73, and continued to complete my residency, all the time increasing my practice in male infertility and getting an actually large number of patients. In 1975, the American Urologic Association decided to embark on a mission to directly fund young clinician scientists. These new investigators were to be called AUA scholars. As a urology resident, considering a future in academics, I knew that I needed to strengthen my area of focus. There really was very little scientific knowledge at that time regarding male infertility, and still only a handful of clinicians who even had an interest in the subject. However, female infertility was continuing to grow and was emerging as a new and truly exciting subspecialty. We were still three years away from the birth of Louise Brown and IVF and the initiation of a totally new era of reproductive medicine. In the meantime, Joe Courier had moved from Penn to become the first chairman of urology at the fledgling University of Texas Medical School at Houston. The new school was literally populated by Penn surgery faculty. Stan Dudrick, Ted Copeland, Bruce McFadgen, Chuck Van Buren, and now Joe Courier. So it wasn't hard seeing myself working with these Penn alumni. I applied for the AUA Scholar, was accepted, and in 1975, my family, which at that time consisted of my wife and two daughters, moved to Houston, Texas, a city that I didn't even know where it was located until I looked it up on the map. I spent the next two years in a basic science laboratory under the directorship of Dr. Emil Steinberger, a very well-known research endocrinologist whose interest was in the reproductive function of both when, men and women. He truly was a pioneer in his time and became my first scientific mentor. I performed my basic research with Dr. Steinberger in his division of reproductive medicine and biology, and at the same time saw patients once a week as an assistant professor of urology, alternating clinical weeks and surgery weeks. One day, Joe Correa came to me and said that he had scheduled a vasectomy reversal for the next morning, didn't know how to do it, and thought that I should do the procedure <laughs> since he had never done one. <laughs> the following day, having read the one article I could find on the technique, <laughs> I completed my first vasectomy reversal, known as a vasovasostomy, using three and a half power loops and five 5 -oh sutures. Interestingly, and more importantly, luckily, the patient and his wife went on to subsequently have five children. <laughs> I, was now, I have now started using a, a regular microscope, 10 sutures, and 25 power magnification. So certainly, things have changed. A friend of mine, Marty McLaughlin, 
who was then head of urology in Vancouver, asked if I could please allow one of his chief residents, Sek Chan, to spend a year with me learning how I performed microsurgery. I did so and discovered that having a fellow was a great experience both for me and for the fellow. And thus in 1982, I started my fellowship in male reproductive medicine. Three years later, having become a professor of urology at the University of Texas, I received an invitation from my close friend, Peter Scardino, who was now chairman of surgery at Memorial Sloan Kettering, to join the Baylor Department of Urology. Joe thought that it was a good idea academically, and I joined Baylor in 1985 and established the first division of male reproductive medicine and surgery. Joe Corey and I have remained close friends to this day. Fast forward to the present date. I have been at Baylor now since 1985, have trained over 100 fellows, five of whom who are now department chairmen, both from here and abroad, and five additional ones who are now practicing in Philadelphia. And I've truly realized the great gift of being in an academic environment. We have now published over 300 manuscripts and three major textbooks. Infertility in the Mail is now in its fourth edition, and just last year we published Management of Sexual Dysfunction in Men and Women, an Interdisciplinary Approach. I give you these statistics humbly and a little embarrassingly because I think it has to be put in the perspective that if we're not for the people who helped me, I would not be standing in front of you today. Giants in their field. Joe Courier, Peter Scardino, Dolores Lamb, Stan Dudrick, Emil Steinberger, to name a few. In thinking about the superb interactive support from which I have so greatly benefited, I now realize that the fellows whom I continue to train have benefited indirectly, yet significantly, from those mentors who have trained me. My conclusion today is quite straightforward and classically stated by Sir Isaac Newton, if I have seen further than others, it is only by standing on the shoulders of giants. Thank you. So, so I think many of us have had the benefit of these phenomenal mentors that we're, we've all, we're all talking about. And I think the unique thing about Penn, when we went through, instead of being just plain old conventional medical school with um, memorization and all the wonderful things we had to do, it, it had a component of um, helping you sort of find your way, having people who could support you in doing interesting things that maybe were not part of your curriculum, but were things that you could do. And I, I certainly found that the research enterprise was very helpful to me in just getting my head wrapped around the scientific method and learning a lot of things. And it directed a lot of careers. And I think that we owe Penn a special bit of thanks for just providing the kind of environment where those opportunities were there for you, that were there for me, and for all of us. And uh, we were lucky to be able to grab them. Um, I also think that the, I, I think that your, the, your magnification probably did not change with new technology. I think your eyes just got worse and you needed the, you needed the microscope, but you were really good with, you had great eyes when you were young. So anyway, uh, so our uh, last of our four speakers is Marvin Mackinnon, who is yet from another piece of where medicine goes. He's a, I would call a hardcore so basic scientist. Uh, we overlapped briefly in the Johnson Foundation when we were, um, we were medical students, and uh, he actually understood what he was doing better than I did and obviously has flourished with it. In, in today's world, he would have been an MD, PhD. He did, he did a lot of work that would pretty much have made him be that even then. And uh, he also has a really interesting story that's not sort of bread and butter, standard medical student story, which he will tell you. This is on permanent kind of slides. Uh, slides. Right. Um, maybe we can. This is your stick? No. 
Yeah. No, I've given it to the slide project. Uh, the projection is okay. okay. It's coming up, but the next one. Uh, can you project further? Uh, okay. Um, the first thing um, I want to say here is um, because I've had an unusual background of having come out of a Soviet prison a year before I started medical school here, in many ways, I didn't really know how to act. It was a particularly traumatic time and as my anatomy partner told me this morning, Michael Kay, that I was a very uncommitted person. I'd like to tell you first how I felt about many things. Um, but the first thing I would like to tell all of my classmates, and this is the only chance that I have had to say this, I would like to thank you for being so kind and understanding that you did not um, give me silly questions like, um, oh, what was it like? Because that would just emotionally um, immobilize me. To tell you one experience um, I had in a class one day during our first semester, Barbara Shoemaker leaned over and told me before the class started, oh, Marvin, I didn't know who you were, but last year I wrote a letter to Nikita Khrushchev to ask for you to be released. At the time, I wanted to hug and kiss her because it was such a kind thought. At the same time, it totally immobilized me emotionally, and I didn't really know what to do. That's the problem with post-traumatic stress disorder, much of what you've heard about. But let me start here. Could you go back one slide, please? Where's the projectionist? No, that's not the first slide. OK, let's start here. That, that's right. No, the previous one. OK, keep it there, please. Through my experience in Soviet prisons and labor camps, I came across hearing about a Swedish prisoner and one person, a fellow prisoner, told me his name was Vandenberg. At the time, I didn't know who this was. I knew nothing about the case. But as this slide shows, okay, he was, Raoul Wallenberg was a Swedish diplomat. He was not a diplomat by career, but he was sent to Budapest in the closing days of World War II. And he's credited with having saved approximately 90,000 to 100,000 Jewish people. Already 400,000 had been sent to Auschwitz. Um, uh, the next slide? No, the previous slide. The previous slide? I don't know how to work this. The next slide, carefully, it's not working. Okay, well, just leave it here. This is an inside picture of the Vladimir prison in the city of Vladimir. It is the heart of ancient Russia. It's about 200 kilometers to the east of Moscow. And I occupied, at the end of my imprisonment there, over a year, I was over about two years there. Uh, this slide where these red lines show the mar map on, on, that, uh, on the second floor. And this person here was Sigurd um my third cellmate. Um, I didn't know anything about it at the time, but my previous cellmate had told me he had heard about a Swedish prisoner. 
in this prison. And so I asked the Gorge Gurmits about that. He had already been the only, only cellmate of Francis Gary Powers, which I knew, and he told me. But from that, I assumed, I felt I had to assume that he was an informant. This is an unusual system whereby people can save time off their sentence if they cooperate with the authorities. But of course, there's no defense against it. They will say anything they can to help their own case. But I asked Sigurds about a Swedish prisoner, had he ever heard of one? And he claimed that earlier when he was working as a prisoner trustee, cleaning floors and windows and so forth, he had met a Swedish prisoner. He claimed he didn't know the name and didn't know what he had done. He said it sounded like it was some kind of intelligence work. But then he said something very unusual. He said he somehow seemed to think that he would be highly rewarded for his work when he returned home. And to me, that was a clear contradiction because if you're in intelligence work, no one knows about it. <coughs> sorry. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I've fouled up. On the top here is my prisoner registration card. It's all in Russian. And it tells uh, the important information about my arrest and so forth. And these red rectangles here are just the uh, time we were, each of us was brought into this cell, 231. This I was able to get photographs of in 1990, the first time I was on an international committee to search for Raoul Wallenberg. But this gave us much information because it is a listing of cells and the date at, on which the prisoner was put into that cell. And as I'll show you later, it became very useful. In my work, I've been on three different international committees. But in 1993, I returned to the Vladimir prison, having been a former prisoner there. And I was told about this woman, Larina Ivanovna, who had worked in the prison um, as a sort of a janitor and assistant, but only in building two, where we, um, where prisoners were kept who were highly isolated and I myself was in that in that uh, prison in that prison building but talking with her I asked her uh, if she she did not know anything about Wallenberg when you're doing forensic interviews you do not feed information and I asked her just um, she knew I was from a committee in Moscow uh, she did not have any international experience. She was, had only the limited Soviet education, I think was only eight years at the time. Um, but I asked her if she had, could remember any foreign prisoners. And um, uh, because the place actually was a location where German prisoners of war were kept. But she remarkably pointed out um, that um, she had recalled a prisoner of non-German origin, that was unusual, and that he was confined, in, he was in solitary confinement on the third floor of Corpus 2, Building 2, in a cell opposite to the, where the prisoner Osmak died. Now, this is many years later. She did not quite remember immediately the name of Osmak, but she recalled it. She said, well, it's like Osmak, I'm not sure. But I showed her different kinds of photographs, some who had been real prisoners, and this was a side profile of Raoul Wallenberg, unpublished in the international press. This was his picture from, as a student at the University of Michigan, she totally ignored this picture. 
This picture here is of uh, Vilmos Longfelder, who was arrested with Raoul Wallenberg in, in Budapest. And we know nothing about him. Uh, the Russians and Soviets have provided no information. But she saw this side picture, and she said, what well on? That's him. This is the person that she recalled. And um, I think that that is um, important because this is a diagram right here of what a cell was like. And there's a door here, and there's a peephole. And since she would have to deliver food, give the food or uh, to the prisoner, or sometimes they uh, saw uh, if a guard had to go into the cell, they would always look through this peephole. And the most frequent view of a person in the cell would have been a side profile. And that's why I think it's important that she picks this one. Um, this is the building two here. There was a uh, medical facilities on the top floor where prisoners were treated if they were kept, uh, and they were often post-surgical treatment kept in this building. Um, anyway, um, this was the cell in which I was. But um, she then, um, I, I then um, was able to do an occupancy analysis. Oh, sorry. Um, I asked her, why does she remember this prisoner? I said, you've seen hundreds of prisoners here, and they all look the same. They're emaciated. They have a gray look on their face. They don't look happy in any way. They're always sad and morose. And she said, this person always complained about everything. She said, if the soup was cold, he was on the third floor of the building. He would complain about the soup. And finally, the head guard said, OK, serve him first. Now, that changed her routine for months. And that's why she remembered this person. Um, I also realized from that statement that this person had to have been a very special prisoner under special regime because an ordinary prisoner would have been sent to the punishment cell for that kind of behavior. But if I can just start this, I'm not sure. Uh, can you, oh, great. This is what it means to be served soup first, to go up to the third floor. This is not the Vladimir prison, but it is from a, a video I found on television. As you can see, there's a little door here, a first disguise it's called, and uh, the person gives a, a bowl of soup and maybe some uh, watery potatoes. Um, the soup often had some fish ice floating in it. Um, it was not, uh, and you can turn that off now, please. Huh? Okay. So I said I had done this cell information data was very important with Ari Kaplan, who coincidentally he was in Chicago, and I met quite by serendipity. He happens to be the database guru of the United States, but he helped me with doing a cell occupancy um, study of this prison. And this was the cell where Osmak died. And she said that this foreigner, non-German origin, was in the cell on the opposite side um, in solitary. We calculated from this study that these two cells, this one 274 days, sequential days, unoccupied according to prisoner information in the archives of the prison, this one, 243 days. This prison was literally packed with prisoners. There was no way in this prison that these cells could have been just left unoccupied for nine months. So it means that at least a very important prisoner was in, that, in, in those cells because the identification from the archives had been taken away. We then later checked from the prison archives um, 
could we get any information about this prisoner, Osmak. It turns out that Kirill Ivanovich Osmak was a very, very well-known Ukrainian nationalist. He died on the night before he was to be released. I saw his autopsy report, and it says on the card here, he died on the 16th of May, 1960, a long time after 1947 when the Soviets and the Russian government has insisted that Raoul Wallenberg died of a heart attack as a young man. He died of a cerebral hemorrhage. Just to finish this off, I want to go through all the various statements, official statements that the Soviet and Russian government have made about Raoul Wallenberg. And as you read through these, you will see that each one contradicts all the previous information. This is very important. This was uh, uh, by Andrei Vyshinsky, later ambassador to the United Nations. But um, he informed the Swedish ambas embassy that Wallenberg is totally unknown to them and has never been on Soviet territory, although we found a memorandum in which he clearly understood that Wallenberg had been already in the Lubyanka prison for two years. And this is towards the final end. This is the really important uh, document. For years, the Soviet government refused to give information to the Swedish government. But because there were returning prisoners of war who had seen and had been in a cell with Wallenberg, the Swedes had collected this information, presented it to the um, Soviet government. And then they produced finally what was called now, what is called now the Gromyko Memorandum, in fact, where they claim that this prisoner of Wallenberg, notice this is misspelled, uh, who is known to you died in the night of July 17th, 1947. There is much information that he did not die at that time. The Soviet uh, government refused to acknowledge that. They only go back to that date, and the Russian government does the same. There have been other statements since that time, but they all contradict uh, what has been said in the past. One of my colleagues discovered some information uh, about a prisoner having been interrogated for 16 hours on July 23rd, 1947, and the answer came back that they cannot dismiss the possibility that that prisoner was Raoul Wallenberg. He was prisoner number seven at the time. This is where I have spent much of my time. It has been completely an intrusion into my family life and into my professional life. But because I learned of Wallenberg myself as a prisoner, I have felt that I cannot not do this work. And um, I think it is important for history to be able to establish his complete uh, history and his fate, and uh, that is still what I am doing. It is much more difficult now. Putin is absolutely, um, totally in complete control. Uh, foreigners have not been able to get into the archives for some time, and we just have to keep working wherever we can to find information. But thank you for your attention. I don't think that Marvin is representative of the average medical school alum or of the medical student back in our era, but it, it, it is reflective of the kind of people that Penn was looking for, which is interesting, smart people. And that was an amazing and touching story. I, uh, 
but it also makes the rest of us who haven't had adventures like that in increasingly grateful of the environment of our country. Despite its ups and downs, we seem to have been lucky to be land in a pretty good place. Um, I, we have a few minutes for some comments by the panel and then some questions. We have about another 16 or 17 minutes. And I, I guess what I'd like to do is I, I'd be curious, how many of the alums here were in the service, uh, public health service, Army, Navy, Air Force? So this was the Vietnam era. And how many of us who did that thought it was a good thing for us? I mean, I, I yeah. <laughs> So that, that it was a positive event. I, I, I agree with that very much. And I, I'm, I'm curious if anyone, anyone on the panel has any comments about his military time and what good things came from. Because we saw it as an inconvenience <laughs> and something that interrupted our trajectories. But in fact, I found it to be a great way to sort of consolidate my clinical information and uh, experience having finished my residency. Any, anybody? As, as I mentioned before, so I, you know, my, my life and career changed because I tried to avoid Vietnam and wound up going into the Air Force. I mean, wasn't particularly enthusiastic about it, but I got this, you know, extra tra calf training that it turned out to be very useful in my life. It was also a great, a, a great interlude uh, between uh, the academic world and the real world from the standpoint of just being a good physician and it was a nice, nice downtime for our growing family too. Between the uh, rigors of uh, of academic life and the rigors of private practice. Well, my, my experience was very different because uh, I f uh, was a resident when they took me. Um, uh, after being told they would not be taking me because they needed a partially trained urologist, since their urologist, who was going to be one of their first trainees in a new residency program had dropped out. <clears throat> so I went there partially trained and spent basically two more years of training. So it was a great experience for me. <clears throat> it would have taken very little for me to stay in had, they, had I not been concerned about moving every couple of years. <clears throat> but interestingly, the two people who were above me in El Paso stayed in El Paso until the end of their careers. So. But it was truly, I mean, it was, and we had a good time because it was then safe to be in El Paso and safe to be on the Mexican border. It was, it's very different now. <clears throat> and I, I, my experience similarly, I, I went from being, you know, one of 30 neurologists in a large program where, you know, even as a chief resident, you were, you were supervised to being one of, two neurologists, one of, the other one of which was a uh, career officer who just wanted to be sure sh she could be out of there s at the right time every day and gave me infinite responsibility and, um, and it was still an easy job. It was, and, and my salary doubled, I thought. And, I, and, I, and I, I, I became a better doctor because I learned independence and I knew I had a telephone, I could always call a friend. Um, did anybody here finish medical school in debt Okay, so there were there were a few of us, but 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 not a lot of us. And now it's uh, Larry. What would you say? Do do some people? Can you tell us a little bit about what how that works today? Because I think that I think that drives specialty choice so unbelievably. Well, you know, I think the first thing that happens is a lot of people enter medical school with debt from undergraduate. And so it's, it's a long process. Uh, you know, our, our debt here varies by student. The, the average is around $115,000 to $120,000. If you look at our peer group of other private medical schools, it's about $190,000. So while those schools have been going up, you know, our, our debt per class has been going down because of the financial aid and, and scholarships. But it's, I would think about it more longitudinally. So you've got undergraduate debt, you've got medical school debt, and then you know, the training after medical school is long. And surgical residencies can be six to eight years. 
um, medical and pediatrics, you've got both the, the three plus specialty. Uh, and, you know, a lot of times uh, people are not earning enough as, as residents and fellows to really cover all of their life expenses. So, you know, what, what happens is you end up being in your, your 30s, uh, starting a family, and people that went to law school or the Wharton School are off, uh, you know, mid-career at that point. So it's, it's a challenge. And I, I, do, I do think it influences medical student choice. Not, not 100%, but I think the biggest influence are the mentors that the students encounter. So if they identify somebody that sparks their interests, they're likely to go into that field. Uh, but they certainly pay a lot of attention, and you could just look at the residency choices, and you see at the top, uh, you know, dermatology and neurosurgery and orthopedic surgery and plastic surgery, and you see at the bottom, uh, physical medicine rehabilitation and neurology and pediatrics. <laughs> I can answer um, a little bit to our daughter's situation. Uh, she did not have debt going into medical school, but now has uh, about a $180,000 debt. And I think uh, it is problematic uh, for medical students. Uh, and part of it, too, is that many people were given the thought that they could get debt forgiveness based on service. Uh, where they served in serving in underserved uh, areas and underserved specialties. But I think um, the government has not <laughs> held to that promise in many cases or has made it very difficult. So I think one thing as physicians, uh, we should perhaps try to advocate for programs uh, that do try uh, to um, forgive some debt, uh, not all necessarily, uh, and not just for medical students, but for graduates in other areas, because it is, I think, a profound uh, weight <laughs> around the shoulders of many of the people who uh, do train and, uh, as you said, uh, you know, want to serve in a special area or something of that sort, uh, but are not going to have the initial salaries uh, that will make the repayment of the debt easy. Thank you. Um, to, okay, so what we're going to do now is I, I, I wanted to close by just asking any of our panelists who'd like to speak or any of the people who have questions or issues or want to raise anything, I'll talk a little bit about the next phase of life that we're all either in the middle of, beginning, or, in, or hope to encounter, which is retirement. And, and looking through the uh, material that that Penn sent, it looks like the majority, but not a huge majority of our class is retired. Um, and um, my own personal feeling is that you have to sort of have, you have to have a plan for rewiring or reorganizing your life. You can't just wake up one morning with nothing to do. Um, mine, I, I filled mine with a fair amount of volunteer stuff and uh, some of it medically related. But I, there are issues of health, there are issues of normal aging, physical limitations, um, goals, and maybe we could start with the folks here about, because Sandy and Betty are retired but are engaged, you might say, and uh, if, any others, if any other people had wisdom or questions, we would address that issue. Um, yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I actually started thinking about the road to retirement, the end game when I was in early, in my early 50s, I think. Uh, you know, all, all sorts of things can, can happen and have happened to a lot of us. Health issues in the cath lab, uh, spine and back issues are a huge problem from all the lead we had to wear. But, you know, uh, changes in, in, in family situation, growing call and beeper fatigue, uh, um, ability to bounce back and function after being up all night in the cath lab or whatever. Um, so I thought of ways to modify, you know, my practice toward the end. And the, 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 you know, when the when the uh, my late fifties came about, um, I, I decided I didn't really want to modify it. I loved doing intervention too much, but I, I still had call and beeper fatigue. I did have problems bouncing back. Um, I threatened to retire at age sixty. Um, as it turned out, for the last three and a half years I worked, I worked exactly half time. I spent two weeks a month in the cath lab doing my thing. Um, they minimized my call. 
uh, to make it palatable. Uh, I spent a, a day during that volunteering at a clinic for the working uninsured. The other two weeks I spent in New Hampshire. We had built this vacation home that we loved, wanted to stay at, and decided to retire to. So I, you know, spent time with my family, our dogs, travel, uh, outdoors, taking adult education courses at Dartmouth. So I did that for three and a half years and retired at age 63, very confident that I had plenty of interests outside of medicine and away from the arena that I love, so to speak, to, to be happy. Well, I think that sort of speaks to what I said in my talk, that uh, having interests outside of science and medicine uh, are helpful, and particularly when you get to retirement. Um, two of the things that I've done, uh, one is to keep open uh, a, a church, a landmark church in Portland, Maine, that was threatened to close. Uh, so advocacy for preservation is one thing that I love to do. Travel uh, is another. And the third was saving a collection of brains that I encourage everybody here to go to the Mütter Museum, which is here in <laughs> Philadelphia. Uh, it was a collection put together by Joseph Chusid and Hyde Donenfeld at the hospital St. Vincent's where I worked. And when the hospital went into bankruptcy and closed, um, initially the people thought that they could make some money off of this collection until they were told that it was not right to traffic in human remains. And so we got a collection of money together from the neurology residents uh, to preserve this collection. And it is now in the muter for everyone to see. And it is being used uh, by the muter for education of Penn's medical students and uh, high school students and others who are interested. So that was one thing that I feel very proud of doing. Okay, uh, Dr. Chiozzi? Ch close. <laughs> Hello. I don't know if you remember me. I'm Chukoma Chedozi. I was the only black student in the class in, to, in 1964. Just a little request. This is the first time I'm coming to one of these reunions, and I was shocked to find that 13 of our classmates have moved on. May I request that we please stand and observe a minute of silence for our classmates who have departed. Can we please stand? May the souls of our departed classmates rest in peace. Now, please let us sit, sit please. Thank, thank you for doing that. Now, in terms of what you do after retirement, I retired from academic practice at I retired from academic practice in, uh, at age 60 from a medical school. I then went off to another, medic, another school to help establish a medical school. I am still in practice. I'm officially 79. And I'm still the dean of a medical school. Actually, I gave up deanship of the medical school last week. But I'm still there, you know, so. I do not know if I know how to do anything else but teach medicine or practice medicine. So it's extremely difficult. I've always, I've lived in Africa since I left medical, left surgical training. So I'm not sure I know what else to do. My wife, Helen, retired at 60 and she hasn't worked a day since then, but she tells me she's not bored. <laughs> I don't know what I would do if I retired so early. Thank you. I, I think we are, is there anyone else who has, who has a compelling question or story? Um, we all have 76 or 75 year old bladders, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> Bring the uh, microphone back, please. 
I just Marvin, why don't you, you want to stand here? This this one works a little better. It might be a simpler. No. Uh, that's a question for which there is no answer yet. That's clear. Uh, there are many, many different possible um, hypotheses about that. First of all, Wallenberg came from a family that controlled uh, Swedish trade, international trade. Uh, the Wallenberg uh, Financial, I mean, they were the Rockefellers of, of Sweden. And um, they controlled trade with the Soviet Union. It is most unusual that they did not put that into a requirement in the trade in the trade agreements. Um, uh, when I was serving on the committee, um, uh, this was a bilateral committee, uh, Swedish-Russian uh, um, committee appointed by the government, and I was allowed to be a permanent consultant uh, at the request of Wallenberg's brother, uh, maternal half-brother, uh, Guy van der Del. Um, one day I happened to ask a person, we were just sitting together at a lunch, and um, he was from the foreign ministry, and I asked him why uh, was the Soviet government so interested in Raoul Wallenberg, because he was, there was a clear military order sent from Moscow uh, to Budapest, uh, to Debrecen actually, where the, um, Soviet army was at that time headquartered uh, in, they had just gotten into Hungary. And the, the clear instructions in that telegram was to arrest Raoul Wallenberg, um, isolate him from uh, anyone from the Swedish embassy and bring him to Moscow by whatever means necessary. And um, uh, this uh, member of the committee, from the uh, foreign ministry said he was thought to have been involved in trying to negotiate a separate peace treaty that would have excluded the Soviet Union. Um, I don't know if that's true. I've never heard that outside of Russia or the Soviet Union. Or, uh, but um, Wallenberg is known to have made a trip to Berlin while he was in Budapest, it is not known why he went there. And he um, did have contact with many, many different uh, German officers uh, high in the army. And in fact, um, one thing a colleague of mine found out, um, Kurt Becher was the procurement officer for Eichmann. And Kurt Becher, um, told this colleague of mine that he had met Wallenberg and he was surprised to find out that he was a diplomat. So it suggests that Wallenberg was doing many other things, uh, but he was sent particularly to save Jewish people, however he could. And um, another possible reason is that um, uh, the Katyn massacre had already occurred and uh, there was an international committee that examined uh, the remains of the, or the, what, uh, that area of Poland and what had happened. And they had concluded that it was done uh, by the Soviet troops and covered their troops, uh, which is correct, but the Soviet government would, was denying that. There was a Hungarian pathologist on that committee, and when he returned to uh, Budapest, he had informed Raoul Wallenberg about this. This was totally um, uh, silent information, but somehow the Soviets knew uh, that uh, Wallenberg was aware of that conclusion, and um, likely they wanted to try to have him uh, make a statement that it was due to the Germans. That was what the Soviets were trying to do. In 1991, when I was uh, in one of these committees in Moscow, uh, Gorbachev, for the first time, admitted that the Soviet troops had carried out the Katyn massacre of Polish officers. Um, that's all I can answer that question with. 
So we're ending only a few minutes late, and we actually started later later than we're ending in terms of minutes. Uh, I'd like to thank the f our four classmates for a very interesting set of stories, and uh, it tells you a little bit about we may not have been diverse in a lot of ways in our class, but in terms of careers, there was diversity. Now, fortunately, medical schools are a little bit different. So thank you all, and thank you guys especially.